you know, some of the Gospels have, like, different versions of, like, how they find the resurrected Christ. Like, some of them say that it's there, those kind of, like, indescribable between Gospels. How do they feature in making it reliable? So how do we explain the differences in the resurrection accounts? Yeah, and there are some other things too, like even when like, not, not really parables, but some of the accounts in the Bible that like, have some information and some are kind of missing, like, you know, uh, with the different stories, right? There's just not exactly the same in all the Gospels. So I guess, I guess you could say like resurrection accounts and like the discrepancies in accounts of the Gospel of Yep. Yeah, we're definitely gonna hit, we're definitely gonna talk about that. We are definitely gonna go there. My my favorite like thing is, um, so the book of Mark is supposed to be an account of Peter, right? Like what Peter understood, like or like saw the whole like life of Jesus, right? and in the one where like uh, Jesus walks on the water, he just took out the part where. Yeah, falls in the water. <laughs> well, that Peter does, it doesn't talk about Peter walking on the water. Yeah, yeah. It just talks about the storm and how Jesus walked on yeah. the water and calmed it. But yeah, Peter like, is just left out of it. <laughs> he's just like, uh, I don't want to let really the generations to be embarrassed about it. Apparently, uh, apparently wait, who doesn't include Peter? Mark. Well, he must not have cared about that then. Well, well, but Mark's account is supposed to be like Peter's account, right? That's what. Uh, uh, oh, okay. So Peter was like, "Don't write that in. Don't put that in." <laughs> so you know what's also funny is if you look at John's gospel, there's like, there's there's things throughout the gospel of John that kind of make John look look better. Like you know the part where there's like where they're like Peter and John are under the tomb, but John got there first. John outran <laughs> yeah. him. And also the part at the end where it's like. <laughs> Where, you know, in Peter's kind of reinstatement there, where um, <clears throat> where Peter then says to Jesus, well, what about this guy? Is he, is he going to die too? And he's like, well, if it, and then Jesus says, if it's my will that he remain till I return, what's that to you? And then John just straight up says, so, so the early believers uh, thought that I'm, uh, that I'm immortal. <laughs> that, the rumor has been circulated that John is immortal. <laughs> Moses saying in Torah, Moses, now Moses was the meekest in all the world. <laughs> and also, even John referring to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. <laughs> Amazing. All right, well, we've got a bit of a small crew here. Um, that's all right. Anna's hiding from us. Oh, there she oh. is. David's just showed up. It's because I'm David. cooking right now, so I, I just don't want all the noises of every of all the cooking well, to happen. The mute function <laughs> is an option, but yeah. <laughs> but my dad's gonna be walking in the background and he's shy. Well, like you know about the, the mute <laughs> function. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we've got Kendra's just joined and looks like the low ends are, are here. And um, thanks everybody for coming. It's wonderful to have, have you guys, I think. I'm really excited about this topic. I, I've i been, you know, part of, part of the thrill for me has been just learning myself. Um, this is not at all my area of expertise but I've certainly enjoyed interacting with, with this subject over the past few weeks as I've, uh, I've, I've read a few books. Uh, I've been like scouring, scouring the internet, reading all kinds of articles. And uh, it's a tremendously important issue in that the gospels are God's word to us concerning the life and claims and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus. And these four ancient biographies have come under tremendous scrutiny uh, by many, many scholars. And I'm sure, you know, for those of you who attend secular universities, who have maybe 
maybe some liberal Christian friends. Uh, I'm sure you've heard all kinds of things about the gospel as to uh, the gospels as to why they're not reliable. So uh, I think the roadmap tonight is simply to identify five of the current main objections to the gospel's reliability and to uh, answer them uh, in turn. So I think, I think this one, unfortunately, is going to be a little bit more luxury just because there's so much that can be said. Uh, there's no end to what can be said. So I've tried my very best to filter, to filter down to, you know, what I see as essential. Uh, but I have, I, I'm not aware of, of even 20% or 10% of what's out there on this issue. Um, but I think as is our custom, I think we should be begin by praying. I'm going to thank God for the life of J.I. Packer as well as uh, we learned of of his passing today, as he's been tremendously influential in my, my own life and faith and understanding. And I think for many more, he has been as well. So thank, thank God for his life as he's gone to be with the Lord uh, today. And um, I've got a quote to, to begin with as well. And I want to take any, any initial questions that you guys have as we, as we dive in, as I like to make sure that what you guys want to hear about is, is talked about throughout the night. So let me say a word of prayer and we will uh, dig in here. Our Father in heaven, we come before you as the God who speaks, even as I was reading the big picture story Bible with Seth tonight, I was reminded of the, the wonderful and powerful words by which you spoke everything out of nothing. And uh, not only have you spoken and revealed yourself in creation, but you have revealed yourself and disclosed your character, mind, and heart through revelation. And we're, tonight we're, we're focusing on uh, the four books of, of the Gospels in the New Testament uh, as they've been revealed from your mind and heart to disclose your son. And I pray that as we think together, about some of these objections uh, to their reliability, that you'd help us and strengthen us and guide us, and that we'd be able to, as Peter commends to us, give a ready defense, uh, to give a ready defense for the hope that is within us. And thank you for Packer, for J.I. Packer and his life. Thank you for his work, and um, thank you for the books, Knowing God and evangelism and the sovereignty of God and for uh, his life of scholarship and his, his heart for, for you and for your people and all that he did for the cause of, of your gospel and, and the majesty of your grace and goodness. And we praise you for that. And we thank you for his life. And we thank you for this time together. And I pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me, uh, you guys can all see this screen, correct? Okay, so let's look at this, this quote here. I think it's a really good one by Craig Blomberg. He's the Distinguished Professor of the New Testament at Denver Theological Seminary. And he says, all in all, the support for the reliability of the New Testament is substantial enough to sustain Christian faith even if it's not so overwhelming as to compel one to believe. I think that's a really, really interesting quote. I think it kind of whets the palate for where we're hoping to go uh, tonight. So what, what questions do you guys have coming into, coming into this discussion? What questions do you guys have? Maybe there's been objections that you've become aware of, uh, criticisms of the New Testament, or the Gospels, and you're interested in uh, hearing something specific, maybe I don't know the answer, maybe I do, maybe I can point you to a resource. What, what um, questions do you guys have?
Don't everybody start talking at once. Joe, you, you can't just do that, man. You gotta, now you have to ask a question. No, no, I don't, I'm, I'm all ears. I don't have, I don't really have any right. questions that pop to the forefront of my mind. I'm all ears tonight. Okay. All right. Uh, well, if nobody has any questions, I mean, I think we have plenty of material here to cover, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, if there was something like pressing that one of you guys have been thinking about that we didn't miss it or something. That, that's, that's really the, the reason I wanted to start that way. Okay, well, if there's no questions, then let's think through some of these, some of these major objections that I think are out there. I, I'm not sure if these are the top five. Um, I'm not sure that these are the, I'm definitely sure that they're not the only five. Uh, but these are five that, as I've been thinking and studying about this issue, have risen to the surface uh, from what I'm aware of. I'm going to read them out. And then we're gonna talk about a couple of facts. Uh, and then we're gonna go through each objection one by one and offer some potential uh, possible answers uh, as responses to these, these claims that the New Testament gospels are not reliable. Number one, the Jesus of the gospels is not a historical character for they are simply fictional narratives. Number two, this is probably the most common and widely uh, accepted in, in secular and liberal scholarship, that the gospel accounts contradict one another. Third, the gospel of John, this is a really interesting one, and I, it's, it's probably my personal favorite. The Gospel of John depicts a different Jesus than the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic uh, is a word referring to the works taking a common view or marked with similarity in content. So the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are generally referred to as the synoptic Gospels, meaning that they are similar in content and presentation. And John is, is, is much different in his layout of the Gospel and in the way that he presents Jesus' ministry and, and even his teachings. Uh, different doesn't mean contradictory, though, we'll explore. So the Gospel of John depicts a different Jesus than the Synoptic Gospels. Number four, books. This is an interesting one. I think this is probably common amongst many of, many of your friends, perhaps, who don't believe in, in Jesus. Uh, books that record supernatural events miracles such as the resurrection of jesus are simply not trustworthy fifth the original documents this one is very important for us to understand the original documents could not have been recorded and copied faithfully and thus to be made available to us today um those are those are some current objections uh, to the reliability of the New Testament Gospels. So any, any just responses or questions or clarifications needed regarding those, those five objections? I'll just say that those last three are like completely new to me. Completely new. Like I've hmm. never heard of those before the first two are pretty familiar to me um but the last three are as i say completely new and i i find them fascinating so i'm i'm interested to hear more <laughs> yeah yeah number three i think is is probably my favorite my favorite objection and i i think it's um it's, it's a complete and total farce uh but it's it's very very widely used to, to argue against the reliability of the gospel. Very, very widely used. Just at, at first read, I think number four is probably the lamest one. Like, <laughs> Yeah, that's like, an interesting one as well. Um, yeah. It, that's also, you know, that, that's, that's everywhere. Um, yeah. So anything you read against the gospels, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll, hear against, you'll hear against miracles for sure. Okay, so a few facts to note. These are just 
these are just things to keep in mind about the Gospels themselves. Like, when were they written? Who were they written by? And how do we know? These are just kind of some facts that we know about the Gospels. Number one, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were probably written. So the reason I say probably is because there's some, there's some variation in thought on the dating of the Gospels. But I, I really like the way Pete Williams talks about this. He's a New Testament scholar at Cambridge House in uh, Tyndale House in Cambridge, where actually Jonathan studied for a time. Uh, and he says that the Gospels came with names on. They did not come with dates on. Uh, and so we, we want to be open-handed to the dating of the Gospels. But because they come with names on, it helps us understand to some degree when they were written. So the Synoptic Gospels were probably written within one generation of Jesus' death. AD 30, while eyewitnesses of his ministry were still alive. And by those who were followers of Jesus or close companions or associates of Jesus' followers. Matthew and Luke likely knew and supplemented Mark. Okay, so Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. And if you believe that he wrote the Gospel of Matthew, there's a lot of people who don't. But if you do, so because the earliest manuscripts that we have of Matthew's gospel come with a superscription that reads Kata Matthias, meaning according to Matthew. So I think it's, 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 it's the burden of proof is on those who don't believe it was written by Matthew. If the earliest manuscripts that we have have an indication that they were, it was written by Matthew. Matthew was a follower of Jesus. John was a follower of Jesus. Mark uh, was a traveling companion with uh, Paul and, and uh, Peter. And Luke was a tra traveling companion of Paul. So the four Gospels, as they're given to us with names on, are attributed to either people who, A, were direct followers, companions, associates of Jesus himself, or companions or followers of Jesus's followers. The Gospels don't go beyond that second generation. And they were all written, probably, during the lifetime of those who were eyewitnesses to the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. An objection to this, okay? And this is the most commonly used objection to the reliability of the Gospels that I'm aware of. And it's related to the um, fifth objection, that the original documents could not have been recorded and copied faithfully to be made available to us today. And one of the things that people say is, well, this is impossible because the Gospels could not have been written by Jesus' followers because they were uneducated Jewish fishermen who spoke Aramaic only. And the four Gospels were written in Koine Greek, very sophisticated Koine Greek. Uh, and you'll, if you watch anything by Bart Ehrman, we're going to tonight, uh, because I want to show how we can break down his thought. Uh, but if you watch anything by Bart Ehrman, he's going to say this all the time. Well, the Gospels weren't written by Jesus' followers, because Jesus' followers were Aramaic-speaking Jewish fishermen who had no education. And the four Gospels were written in Koine Greek, and therefore they couldn't have written the Gospels. But that just simply doesn't follow, because I want you guys to open up to the book of Romans and to verse chapter 16 and verse 22. Romans 16 and verse 22. Now, I'm just going to ask... I think I know what verse this is. <laughs> yeah, it's an important verse. So... I want to ask anybody who's willing to share, who wrote Romans? Paul wrote Romans. Paul wrote Romans. Okay. Now, somebody please read Romans 16, verse 22. 
I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Okay. Yeah, that's so funny. That's what my dad said. He's in the background. He's like, no, Paul didn't write it. It was, it was scribed by somebody else. He knew the verse before it was read. There we go. There we go. That's true. So why am I bringing this up? Well, because Paul was a Jewish scholar who is extremely well-versed in the Septuagint, which is the Koine Greek translation of the Old Testament. He's a Greek scholar as well as a Hebrew scholar. He was a Pharisee. He was the highest educated person in the land where Jesus is living uh, in the first century. And he made use of an amanuensis or a scribe. And so how could it possibly be illogical to say that the four gospels writers also made use of an amanuensis or a scribe? Because there were, when Jesus is, is performing his miracles, it's very clear in all four of the Gospels that as he's performing miracles, there are people from Judea and Samaria and, and Galilee who are seeing the miracles of Jesus and are converting and believing in him and starting to follow him. So there are Greek speakers uh, and, and Hebrew and Aramaic speakers that are seeing Jesus perform his miracles and believing in him and starting to follow him all the time. So it makes perfect sense that one of the four gospel, all four gospel writers, um, I, I'm not even convinced anyways that, one, that they, all, they couldn't have also been speaking Greek because it, it was the English of the first century. So like there are people who aren't native English speakers that speak English all over the world. But I think that it's very possible that they use an amanuensis. So I think that basically just debunks that that claim and objection that it's impossible for the immediate followers of Jesus to have written the Gospels. If that makes some sense. Um, the other fact to note is that John was likely written a generation later and has no literary relationship to the other Gospels. And what I mean by this um, is that his Gospel didn't depend on any of the other three as source material. I'm not saying that he wasn't aware of Mark's gospel. I think he probably was. But he doesn't appear to use Mark as a primary source as he composed his gospel. And most scholars date it um, as far as about 60 years after Jesus' death. So it could have been written as late as 80, 90. Uh, it could have been written as, as early as 80, 60 closer to the other gospels uh, when they would have been written. So those are just some those are just some uh, some facts. It is widely believed even by even by people who don't believe that the gospels are reliable that Mark was the earliest gospel, uh, earliest of the four gospels and that Matthew and Luke used Mark as source material as they wrote their gospels. Um, and that's just simply by observing the text them, themselves because Matthew and Luke seem to expand upon what Mark says. So Mark's, Mark's gospel, when you read it, it's like immediately this happened and immediately this happened and immediately this happened and immediately this happened. It's like a, it's like a Jesus fire hose. When, when Matthew and Luke are, are a little bit more theologically driven uh, and there's, there's more speeches included by Jesus and there's more parables you know, included by Jesus. Uh, it's, it, but vast amounts of the text are verbatim uh, the same with Mark. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's widely contested and debated as to which one, Matthew or Luke, is earlier than, than the other. But everybody agrees that Mark is the first. Okay, so how do we, any, any follow-up to any of that? Those are, I'm just trying to lay the groundwork for some of what people know about the Gospels. When were they written? How far from Jesus' life and death and resurrection were they written? Who probably wrote them? And what are reasons why we think that they wrote them? Is that, is that helpful? Any, any follow-up? Okay. 
You guys are being nice. Or this is just like super boring. Okay. So let's go through these objections and we'll think together about how we might be able to answer them. So just feel free, like I think you guys probably have a raise hand function. If you don't, just unmute yourself and yell at me or uh, make a crazy waving, waving action or whatever. Okay, so the first objection. The Jesus of the Gospels is not a historical character. For they are simply fictional narratives. Um, I think I don't know. I don't know who who's come across something like this. Maybe use your little hand raise uh, icon if you've heard somebody argue something like this before, or unmute or whatever you want to do. Okay. Yep. So. The Gospels are no different than some kind of, you know, fantasy book or, or fairy tale. Um, I think the first thing to say about this is that that's just not responsible. Uh, that's just not a responsible thing to say when examining the scholarship. Because, you know, when you, when you do your research and whether it is that you, you look at uh, Muslim scholars, secular scholars, uh, Christian scholars, everybody essentially believes amongst all modern historical scholarship that there was a Jesus of Nazareth that was crucified on a Roman cross and buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. Almost everybody agrees with that which is significant uh, in light of the fact that that is exactly what all of the Gospels claim. Um, so at the very least, all of the Gospels are aware of those historical facts. So they have to be within uh, a generation of, of the events themselves. Um, let's look through some of these possible answers. So when examining somebody's claim like that, I think the first thing that we should do is to say, well, how do the Gospels themselves present their information? So uh, the first place you want to look is, you know, something, something in the Gospels that explains why it is that they are being written. So two of the Gospels tell us why it is they exist. Who knows which Gospels those are? Somebody, somebody share with me. Which Gospels tell us why they exist? Yes, Joe. Well, you got the first one right there. Dead giveaway, Luke. Um, yep. Yep. <laughs> um, is the other one Mark? The other one is not Mark. Oh, it's John. It's John. Yes, it is. Of course. Yeah. So John in chapter 20 and verse 30 tells us that these things, namely everything that's written in chapters 1 through 20 up until he writes this, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. Luke opens up his gospel. So John ends his gospel telling you what, what it's for. Luke opens his gospel by writing that um, in as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So he's telling He's telling us that he's writing for a Greek audience by including uh, Theophilus, who was probably a, a church leader to a Greek-speaking Christian church in the first century, uh, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Okay? What fantasy novel have you ever read that opens up with something like that whatsoever?
I have never read one. I open up Lord of the Rings and I see concerning hobbits. I've never seen a hobbit. Have you seen a hobbit? No. Luke is saying that he's writing these, these stories down so that you, Theophilus, and your church, and the people who have heard these stories about Jesus and are experiencing persecution and probably doubt, so that you might have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. Certainty. That's a big claim. So Luke reveals the intent of his gospel and thus must not be read as a fictional narrative, but rather as an ancient biography that's given to us with the express purpose of providing certainty regarding the events surrounding the life and death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. That's why Luke exists. Any, any follow-up to, to that? Okay. Now, before I go to the second one, I want to show you a video by a guy named Bart Ehrman. Who has heard of Bart Ehrman before? Raise your hand. Okay, Richard's heard of him. Joe might have heard of him. That name sounds slightly familiar. Okay. <laughs> well, um, Bart Ehrman is a multiple best-selling author on the New York Times bestsellers list. He grew up as a uh, conservative evangelical Christian. He attended Moody Bible Institute for his undergraduate. He attended Wheaton College for his graduate studies, and then he went to, uh, I believe, Yale for his doctorate and uh, has done postdoctorate work at Cambridge and other places. But he, along the way, lost his confidence in, in the New Testament as, as reliable historical documents. He never says that they are not uh, profitable for your you know, theological conclusions or your religious texts. He, never, he doesn't argue against Christianity when he's talking about the reliability of the Gospels. He's simply, con he's simply concerned with the Gospels as historical documents. Um, and I want you guys to, to listen to this video as somebody who clearly doesn't believe that the Gospels are, what's in them is true. Um, because I want, you, I want you to read this next quote about the historical Jesus from Ehrman's perspective, uh, knowing what he believes about the Bible. Uh, can you guys see this? Yes? Okay. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not showing this to like try to like stir you guys. We're going to watch a video after we go through the quote from William Lane Craig that deals with this very, very well. Um, but I just want to see that, want you to see the power by which he argues because anybody who considers this question has come to grips with him. He is the primary voice, the antagonist voice to this issue, period, in the world. Everybody needs to know who this guy is, and you need to know why what he's saying is, is wrong, okay? So let's watch what he says here. This is just one of the, one of the debates that, that he uh, is in, and I just want to know when to stop it. 902, okay, here we go. Simply read Mark's account of Jesus' death and then read John's account of Jesus' death and make a list of everything that happens in both and compare your lists. You will find that there are stunning differences. In fact, there are discrepancies. Let me give you just a list of very quick examples. What day did Jesus die on? That's a simple question. And luckily, we're told in both Mark and John. In Mark's Gospel, we're told that Jesus died the day after the Passover meal was eaten in Jerusalem. John tells us explicitly, chapter 19, verse 14, that Jesus died the day before the Passover meal was eaten, on the day of preparation for the Passover. That's different. 
He couldn't die both days. What about the time? According to Mark, he died at 9 in the morning. According to John, he wasn't, he wasn't condemned to death until afternoon. John 19, 14. These are accounts that differ from one another. Did Jesus carry his cross the entire way to Golgotha, or did Simon of Cyrene carry it? It depends which gospel you read. Did both robbers mock Jesus, or did only one of them mock him and the other come to his defense? It depends which gospel you read. Did the curtain in the temple rip in half before Jesus died, or was it after he died? It depends which gospel you read. I can give you the references for all of these if you need me to, or you can look them up yourself. I'm not making these up. Those are just differences about Jesus' death. What about differences in the accounts of his resurrection? Well, who went to the tomb on the third day? Did Mary Magdalene go alone, or did Mary go with other women? Depends which gospel you read. If with other women, how many of them were there? What were their names? And which ones were they? It depends which gospels you read. Was the stone rolled away before the women got to the tomb or not? What did they see in the tomb? Did they see a man? Did they see two men? Or did they see an angel? Depends which gospel you read. What were they told to tell the disciples? Were the disciples supposed to stay in Jerusalem to see Jesus? Or were they supposed to go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. Did the women tell anybody? Or were they silent about it? Depends which gospel you read. Did the disciples ever leave Jerusalem? Or did they immediately, did they never leave, or did they uh, leave and go to Galilee? Depends which gospel you read. My conclusion, these are not reliable historical accounts. There are too many discrepancies. The accounts are based on oral traditions that have been in circulation for decades. Year after year, Christians tried to convert others by telling them stories to convince them that Jesus was raised from the dead, and they changed their stories while trying to convince people. These authors were not eyewitnesses. They're Greek-speaking Christians living many years after the fact. They're telling stories that Christians have been telling all these years. There was nobody there taking notes. Some of the stories were invented. Many were changed. For this reason, these accounts are not as useful as historians would like as historical sources. What I've given you so far is... All right. So that's what he believes about the text. But what does he believe about Jesus? So we're still talking about um, people who object that the Gospels are not historical accounts whatsoever and that Jesus is a fictional character. Bart Ermey. Whatever else you want to say about Jesus of Nazareth, I think you can say that he certainly existed. The idea that Jesus did not exist is a modern notion. It has no ancient precedence. Even the enemies of the Jesus movement thought that Jesus had existed. Okay? The person that I'm aware of in the world who is most antithetical to Christianity as a historically reliable Creed, believed that there was a Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified on a Roman cross and was buried by Joseph of Arimathea. I think that's significant. I think that's tremendously significant. Um, because he's looking for every reason to not believe those things. And as a historian, he says the word certainly, which appears in the very account that we read in Luke in chapter 1. And I think that's wonderful. We are going to look back uh, at what William Lane Craig says to refute Airmen as he's um, presenting these um, apparent discrepancies. Third, an overwhelming amount of ancient extra, this is really important, an overwhelming amount of ancient extra-biblical sources confirm the historical existence of people, events, and places in the Synoptic Gospels. So at the very least, this separates them from a fairy tale like the Lord of the Rings. There is no such place as Isengard, okay? Helm's Deep does not exist. 
but in historical extra biblical sources, there is overwhelming data that the persons, places, and events of the Gospels certainly exist and certainly occurred. So this is a quote by Craig Blomberg on this, who is the person we quoted in the beginning of tonight. He says, at least a dozen extra biblical references in non-Christian Jewish, Greek, and Roman sources in the earliest centuries of the Christian era, Josephus, Thallus, Suetonius, Tacitus, Pliny, and Mara, then Serapon, Lucian, and several Talmudic tractates confirm the main contours of the synoptics. Jesus' birth out of wedlock, his intersection with the ministry of John the Baptist, the existence of his brother James, his gathering of disciples, including five who are named, his running afoul of the Jewish leaders and interpretations of the law, his working wondrous feats, and his being deemed a sorcerer who led Israel astray, we learn that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and thus between AD 26 to 36, that his followers believed he was the Messiah and believed that he had been resurrected, and that his death did not put an end to those beliefs. Instead, his followers rather quickly began meeting together and singing hymns to him as if he were a god. So he's just citing these first century sources, extra biblical, non-Christian sources, uh, as he's writing these things. And finally, uh, geographical and top topographical references are also abundant in John, and they've been consistently corroborated by archaeological finds, e.g., the pools of Bethsaida and Siloam, so according to John 5 and John 9, Jacob's well, according to John 4, Solomon's portico, Gabbatha, Bethany, and more. So those are all uh, corroborated and um, discovered by geographical and topographical finds. Uh, so these, it's it just not logically or, or intellectually responsible to say something like Jesus didn't exist, uh, according to all of those facts. So is that, is that helpful? Is that any, any follow-up to, to that? Questions? Rise of heresy. All right. Okay, then. Number two. So we watched the airman video. So the, the second one and probably the most widespread objection is that the gospel accounts contradict one another. So let's watch William Lane Craig refute Bart Airman. Here we go. I swear that Bart Ehrman actually uses the conflicting accounts in the Gospels to show that the resurrection couldn't have happened. He asks his audience how many women actually went to the tomb. Was it one? Was it two? Was it Mary Magdalene alone? Or was it with Mary and other women? And why do we have them going into the tomb in one account and running away scared in another? These are types of questions he usually asks. Doesn't this conflict, uh, doesn't this conflict with Dr. Craig's statement that Bart Ehrman has no problem with the historian carrying out step one of his argument? The short answer is yes, it does conflict. Bart Ehrman is in conflict with himself. As I pointed out, if you listen to his historical Jesus lectures with the teaching company in those lectures, he affirms the historicity of all of those facts upon which the resurrection is based. The honorable burial by Joseph of Arimathea, the discovery of the empty tomb by women, the post-mortem appearances to different individuals and groups, and the origin of the earliest disciples' sincere belief that Jesus was risen from the dead. When Ehrman gave the teaching company lectures, he was fully aware of all of these conflicts in the secondary details that he likes to talk about. But as a good historian, he recognized that these sorts of features do not serve to call into question 
the historical core of these narratives, which he then affirmed. What happened is that later on, I think where he saw this was, when he saw where this was leading, he then suddenly began to back away and say that he doesn't affirm the burial in the tomb or the uh, historicity of the empty tomb. And when you look at his reasons for this, there's no new evidence that he's since discovered, uh, no new factors that would cause him to doubt that he wasn't aware of before. He just points to these same discrepancies in the secondary features of the narratives and now says that these are grounds for skepticism. Um, and I think that just shows bad historical judgment. I think he saw that given the facts of the burial, empty tomb, post-mortem appearances, and origin of the disciples' faith in Jesus, that it is uh, very difficult then to deny that the best explanation of these facts is the one the disciples gave, namely Jesus rose from the dead. And so to avoid that, he began then to deny these facts, uh, appealing to these discrepancies. You think the goal is just to provide a kind of a mist of skepticism around it that, well, here's a lot of stuff that we don't know. And so uh, maybe we don't know about any of it. And it's, it's not really intended to be an actual critique of, um, of the historical case. Well, in his debates, if you've ever heard him, it's a it's a powerful rhetorical ploy. You know, he'll say, was it dark when the women had gone to the tomb or was the sun already risen? Depends on which gospel you read. Was Mary um, and Salome the women who went to the tomb or was it? Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, depends on which gospel you read. And he says this over and over <laughs> and over again. It makes it sound like these gospel narratives are hopelessly contradictory, when in fact he knows that the gospel accounts are in complete accord with respect to the historical core of these narratives. Um, and I would invite our students to just take a simple exercise of looking at the four Gospels, I did this once, and record every feature of the narrative that is found in all four Gospels. And you will construct quite a nice historical account. If you include details that are found in three out of the four Gospels, it will be an even longer account. Uh, and what that illustrates is that the Gospels are in essential agreement with respect to things like the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus, despite the sort of discrepancies that, as you pointed out, Russ, uh, one will find in eyewitness testimony in typical cases. <laughs> So what's interesting to note about that is that um, Lane Craig is just pointing out that when asked about the, you know, the core elements of the gospel message, uh, was Jesus crucified and buried and risen on the third day? Was there, were there empty tomb visits and um, resurrection appearances? Ehrman never criticizes those events because there are, it's unquestionable that the four Gospels are in complete agreement on those core issues. Now, er, uh, Craig didn't address the secondary apparent discrepancies that Ehrman always attacks. Um, he's just using the word discrepancy because that's the way that Ehrman talks about them as well. And it doesn't mean they're discrepancies. It's just that they're apparent discrepancies. And we're gonna talk about ways that we can work through those. Um, but it's, what he's doing is just pointing out that what Ehrman is doing is he's um, not only contradicting himself, but he's also using powerful rhetorical ploys to get lay people to believe that because there are some apparent discrepancies amongst the secondary details amongst the four gospels, uh, that that makes the primary claims of the Gospels also obsolete and not reliable. And he's, and he's just saying that that doesn't follow. 
Does that make sense? Okay. So what are some possible answers to uh, the claim that the Gospels um, contradict themselves? Well, uh, I've been working through this book this week, and we, we talked about it, I think, last week at YA, but it's, it's by Vern Poitras, and it's a book called Inerrancy and the Gospels, God-Centered Approach to the Challenges of Harmonization. Uh, Crossway published it. It's popular level. It's it's not a hard read. Uh, I thought I thought it was pretty pretty helpful. Uh, just reestablishing a God centered worldview when we approach these questions. Um, and one of the things he talks about is the discipline of harmonization. So um, this was a common practice amongst early commentators of the Gospels. So uh, Saint Augustine, for example, was Calvin's favorite theologian. When he approached the Gospels, he had the disposition that all of them are true. So how am I going to comment on these Gospels? I'm going to comment on all of the events as they appear in the Gospels, but together, because I believe that they're one cohesive narrative from four different perspectives. So he calls it a harmonization of the four evangelists. Calvin did the very same thing. Why? Because he believed that they were the inspired word of God, and that they're cohesive stories telling one story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And what's happened in modern scholarship is to say, no, 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 no. That is not the right way to approach the Gospels. And I think in some sense that's right. But they'll say that each Gospel is an independent literary unit, meaning they probably weren't aware of one another, they are not interested in expanding upon what the other gospel writers were saying. They're not cooperate, cooperative at all, um, and they're actually contradicting. Um, but as this point shows, Matthew and Luke, and Ehrman agrees with this, Matthew and Luke were likely composing their gospels with Mark as their source material. So the conclusion is, therefore, that harmonization is a valid route for explaining gospel differences. Example. So um, what one thing, one thing that Ehrman will do, if you watch some of his debates, is he'll say, the Jesus that approaches the cross in Luke is a completely different Jesus than approaches the cross in Mark. Because in Mark... When Jesus is going to the cross, he says absolutely nothing. And when he gets to the cross, he doesn't say anything to anybody. He, he stays completely silent. And then right before he dies, he looks up to God and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a citation of Psalm 22 in verse 1. And then Aramin will say, well, if you look at Luke, on the way to the cross, Jesus uh, sees some women, and he looks at them, and he cares more about the women than he does about himself. And he says, you know, I weep for you, women of, of Jerusalem. And then he gets to the cross, and there's these two men that are crucified with him. And he's ministering to these men as he's being crucified. And he, and he, tells, the one, he tells the one robber, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then before he dies... He looks up to God and he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. So Ehrman says, and that's a citation of Psalm 31 and verse 5. So Ehrman says, those are two different Jesuses. In Mark, you have a hopeless Jesus who's crying out to God in despair, asking why he's forsaken him. In Luke, you have a Jesus who's completely in control. He's ministering to the women as he's, after he's been scourged and he's carrying his own cross to Golgotha. And then He's up there ministering and giving hope to this dying thief. And then he commits his spirit into the hands of God. But it's not necessarily so that this is two different Jesuses. Because according to Mark, there was a second cry of Jesus after he cried out to God, Why have you forsaken me? And so if indeed Matthew and Luke were aware that Mark's gospel existed and they were using it as their source material, it's very possible for Luke to have said, 
well, I need to fill in the gap for what this second cry of Jesus was on the cross. And he shows us that Jesus not only cited Psalm 22, 1, but he also cited Psalm 31, 5. But it's also worth mentioning that if you look at the context of Psalm 22, 1, verses 8 and 9 of the psalm, talk about how the condemned person crying out to God still trusts him. And so even in the context of the verse that the apparently despairing Jesus is crying out to God, he would have been very aware that the psalmist himself still maintains his trust in God despite his despair, which is, can, makes it consistent with the second cry of Jesus according to Luke. That was a fire hose, but any, any thoughts or, yeah, Anna. Um, so I remember once being taught about how to like dispute um, people thinking that the gospels contradicted each other yeah. by looking at it. Um, so when, when an accident happens or something and police need to like take statements, they interview many different eyewitnesses. And as long as the main event is in common, that's what makes it matter. Because the thing is, even if there are some discrepancies, it's how that person saw it. They were from a different perspective and either certain things stood out to them or they didn't even notice that that happened. So just because someone didn't hear Jesus say something, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's not yeah. to be looked at that way. Because if, if the gospels were looked at like critically from like a police investigation way, they'd be like, okay, this clearly happened because it's, four different people's perspectives mm -hmm. on a main, on a main event. And you can see the little discrepancies that an eyewitness account would have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's exactly why people try to try to uh, discount the fact that they were written by eyewitnesses because they know that. And they want to say, no, 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 no. These, these accounts were written according to oral tradition. And there's absolutely no way that Ehrman knows that he's, He's seeing the accounts through his pain and through the experience of feeling betrayed by God and then coming to the conclusion that there isn't a sovereign and benevolent God that cares for us and would preserve his word for our good. And so he attacks them and he doesn't want us to think that they were written by the eyewitnesses of Jesus's life, death and resurrection so because, of, because of what you're saying. And there's other scholars, like there's a guy named Michael Kona. He's not an inerrantist, but I think he's an important voice. Um, and he, he looks at the Gospels in comparison to the other ancient biographers that we have. And he says, if you look at the Gospels versus the other ancient biographers who are looked at as very historically reliable, the consistency within the Gospel is, it's not even close. It's way, way more consistent than the other historians that people depend upon for other, for other characters in, in ancient history other than Jesus. Uh, so that's really, really interesting. Somebody is not muted. And we're getting some noise, but it looks like everybody is. Okay, that's really helpful, Anna. I think you're 100% right. Um, okay, so that's the first one. Matthew and Luke were likely composing their Gospels with Mark as their source material, and therefore harmonization is not an invalid technique to explain some of the... Um, differences in the Gospels while maintaining a belief that they're not discrepancies, mistakes, or contradictions. That's the first thing to say. The second thing to say, and this is, this is really important, it also can open up a can of worms if you're not careful, but it's really, really important. The Gospel writers were operating under different assumptions than we are. So here's what I mean by that. So one of the things that Ehrman will do in some of his debates is he'll be like, if you gave me a map and I asked, I, I want to figure out how to get to some place and you hand me a map and I follow the map and it doesn't take me to the place one out of 10 times, that map is not reliable. So what he's doing is he's projecting modern assumptions about what maps should do on ancient biographical accounts about Jesus of Nazareth, which is not a fair thing to do. Okay, so here's a few things that need to be 
considered about ancient biographies in uh, ancient Rome, Greco-Roman biographies in the time of Jesus. Craig Blomberg, apparent contradictions among parallel gospel accounts can usually be explained by the historical conventions of the day. Okay, so while the gospel writers were writing, they were operating just like a biographer is today with what are the, what are the typical conventions of a biography? Okay, so I have a quote from Nabil Qureshi's preface to his autobiography, which is probably my favorite autobiography, Seeking All of Finding Jesus. Here's what Nabil Qureshi says about his own autobiographical account. Since we have entered the digital age, it's unfortunately and increasingly true that people, people expect in exact inappropriately stringent standards on narrative biographies. By its very nature, a narrative biography must take certain liberties with the story it shares. Please do not expect camera-like accuracy. That is not the intent of this book. And to meet such standards, it would have to be a 22-year-long video, most of which would bore even my mother to tears. The words I have in quotations are rough approximations. A few of the conversations actually represent multiple meetings condensed into one. In some instances, stories are displaced in the timeline to fit the topical categorization. In other instances, people who were present in the conversation were left out of the narrative for the sake of clarity. Women and angels, for example, the women and the angels of the empty tomb. All of these devices are normal for narrative biographies. They are, in fact, normal for human mnemonics. Please read this book and the narrative biographies it references accordingly. Unfortunately, we don't have a preface like that for the Gospels. But thankfully, there are scholars that have done a lot of work on looking at other ancient biographies and then compared them to the four Gospels. And we find that they're much, much more reliable than those, those other ancient biographies. Namely, because not coincidentally, they're inspired by God. Uh, so here's what he says. Um, in a world without quotation marks or any felt need for them, communicating another person's intent in one's own words was completely acceptable. Sometimes the gospel writers each excerpt different portions of a larger whole. Sometimes they use different degrees of precision and they regularly arrange their material topically as well as chronologically. So John, for example, tells us the reason why he's writing his gospel. It's so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing you might have life in his name. So John is going to do whatever it takes in his gospel to get you to believe that. And if that means he's going to arrange his material topically as well as chronologically, he'll do it. So here, here's the biggest example that you'll find people talk about between John and the Synoptic Gospels. And it's the question of when Jesus uh, came into the, the temple and got really mad that people were, were exchanging goods and uh, making God's house a den of, of robbers or whatever it is that he said. John places that, that event at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the Synoptic Gospels place it at the end of Jesus' ministry. Airman might say something like, well, which one was it? Um, what we're trying to say here is that if indeed the gospel writers were operating under different conventions than our expectations for them, then they aren't necessarily historically unreliable if one of them move an event like the, like the um, cleansing of the temple to the beginning of Jesus' ministry as a follow-up to his presentation of Jesus as the temple or the uh, wedding at Cana where there's this ceremonial jars that are there that are filled with water that he turns to wine as a, as a symbol of his sacrifice as the Lamb of God. And John puts this cleansing of the temple immediately after the wedding at Cana as a thematic and topical move to communicate the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. It doesn't mean, A, that the event didn't happen. It doesn't mean, B, that the event didn't happen in relation to the other events as it's stated in the Gospels. It just appears that one Gospel says that it occurs at the beginning of 
of the ministry, or at least it's occurring at the beginning of the presentation of the ministry, and the others put it as it appears toward the end of Jesus' ministry. So the conventional um, posture of the gospel writers of the time is extremely important. Michael Kruger says this, when you understand ancient historiography, often authors take a story from a particular individual's life and don't put it in chronological order, but for thematic reasons, topical reasons, and other reasons, put it in other places. Michael Kruger is the president of Reformed Theological Seminary, and he is an inerrantist and a faithful evangelical scholar. Uh, a website to be aware of is the Airman Project. So there's been widespread response to all of Airman's books, and they appear in hundreds of videos on this website. And it's fascinating to see each and every uh, objection that Airman takes to the gospel refuted by very competent New Testament scholars. And I would commend that website to you, the airmanproject.com. Uh, any any follow-up to, to that one? The, the, that's a little bit of a technical and academic one, but I think it's important. Any follow-up to the gospel writers were operating under different conventions than we're used to? Any questions? Nobody's mad yet? It's hard to know. You're being so quiet. I think everybody's still here, so that's good. All right. Anna just turned her video off. She fell asleep. That's fine. Joe looks happy. Joe's happy. I'm happy. The Lowens, the Lowens are smiling. That's basically what I live for. Zot, Zot looks happy. That's good. Adam, we just agree with you. We just have nothing to disagree with. So we're just silent, you know? You're just, you're, you're, free, to, you're free to contribute though, brother. You know, I did have something like, I don't know if we're going to get to this later perhaps or something, but there's also like, I've also heard one thing in regard to like the differences in the ordering of things in the gospels is that and the difference in the material they choose to have in and choose to omit i've heard one argument that says well you know the, the four gospel writers are like they're attempting to to show jesus like in a completely they're after four separate things like they're highlighting four separate different aspects of you know of jesus's person like for instance matthew is like saying is 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 showing jesus as the fulfillment of the old testament the you know the fulfillment of of all the old testament prophecies and all that because he's always like this was to fill fulfill this prophet this was to fulfill what was written here you know whereas what is it is john moore trying to show like the divinity and then one of the other gospels is like trying to show how how he's fully man and so i've heard that argument brought into into the play as well which i think is very good and, oh. go ahead brother i was gonna i was just gonna say you're still on mute <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look like you were trying to talk <laughs> the computer gave me a little warning um no i think what what's related to what you're saying is that like luke says his he's writing to a greek audience and it's very apparent because of the way Matthew opens his gospel that he's writing to a Jewish audience as he spells out the, the Jewish lineage of Jesus as it goes back to Abraham. So uh, it's very important to realize that the gospel writers are writing to different audiences as well. I think that's related to what you're saying, Joe. Um, okay, here's the next possible response to the gospels contradict themselves. Differences are not necessarily contradictions. Uh, I don't think we're going to have time to watch this Rob Plummer video, but um, you can access this handout on our virtual church page. And all of the resources that I listed have hyperlinks and everything. So you can use that and you can uh, make use of all of these resources and videos. 
Um, I don't think we're going to have time to, to watch every single one of them. But I do want to read w one example of two accounts that differ and yet do not contradict. Uh, and this is the, the primary example that uh, Poitras weaves through his book, Inerrancy in the Gospel. So uh, everybody get out a Bible, and I'd love for somebody to read Luke 7, Luke 7, 1 to 10. Luke 7, 1 to 10. This is the account of Jesus healing the centurion's servant. Jesus healing the centurion's servant. I can. All right, brother, go for it. All right, Luke 7, 1 to 10. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I do not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. Is it until 10? Yes, it is. Okay, sorry. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Before you mute yourself, could you, Chris, unmute yourself. I want you to tell us the story in Chris language. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? What happened? Well, um, so there was a, a centurion who was... Um, there was a centurion who was really good to the Jews. He was Roman, but he was really good to the Jews because he helped them build the synagogue, which is not really normal because uh, the Romans were kind of, you know, they were taking, they were in control of the Jews and they, and most centurions were not really that helpful. If anything, they were causing trouble among the Jews. So this man was actually a good man. So he basically sends Jewish leaders to uh, Jesus uh, to basically ask him to help heal uh, his soldier and Jesus like and the Jews like, kind of give this testimony about him saying that he's a good person he actually helps um, Jews and he helps us build the synagogue and stuff like that and then um, Jesus uh, decides to go and heal uh, the servant however as he's going this the centurion sends sends another some other servants to come and stop Jesus and say he kind of recognizes the authority that Jesus has and kind of equates it to the human authority that he has over his soldiers. Uh, and he says, you know, I have a, this kind of authority over the soldiers where I say to this man, go, and he goes. I say to this man, come, and he comes. And the same way, uh, he recognizes that Jesus has that kind of uh, supernatural authority where he's able to, like, do the same thing to illnesses. So he says, you know, and he also is very meek in the, in the sense that He's, he does not consider, I, like the line, I do not find myself worthy is incredible because he finds himself not worthy enough to even have Jesus, who's this, this great person, come to his house. And uh, yeah, Jesus is just blown away by that. He looks at his servants and like, uh, that he says, you know, not even in Israel have I seen such faith. And, and yeah, and just as uh, uh, the, the, the centurion had asked, they go home and they find the servant well. The dudes, the dudes that he sent come back and the servant is, is better. Yeah. All right. Thank you, brother. Uh, somebody now, if you'd, if you'd be so kind, somebody read Matthew 8 and verses 5 through 13. I got you. 
Matthew 8, 5 to 13. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion, centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. My servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be th sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion Jesus said, "Go, let it be done for you as you have believed." And the servant was healed at that very moment. Okay, now Joe, please relay that story to us in Joe's. <laughs> So again, this centurion has a sick servant, and and so he says to Jesus, you know, come and heal him. And Jesus says, I will. But then the centurion says, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Say the word, and he'll be healed. And Jesus is blown away by that, and, and then says, you know, go. And then says the word, and sure enough, this, the servant is healed. <laughs> Okay, so what are the what are the differences between those accounts? The primary one I'm seeing is in Matthew here it's saying the centurion himself actually comes to Jesus. Like the dude himself shows up. Whereas in Luke didn't it say he sent guys like he didn't come, he he sent he sent some dudes to speak for him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That'd be the primary thing. I mean, also there's this there's this whole spiel that Jesus goes on that's not recorded in Luke. Yeah, that, that's probably a secondary difference, right? Yeah. So the primary difference is, did this guy go to Jesus, or did he send his the Jewish elders and then a second wave of friends to go and plead with Jesus to heal a servant? Which one was it? You know, to use the depends on which gospel you read, right? Like. Uh, to use the airman speed. But does it follow that those stories contradict? Why or why not? Anna, yeah. Um, again, I don't think it contradicts. Like, I feel like um, where, where it doesn't say that he sent um, people, he just went directly. They were just pro probably like, well, they were representing him, so we're just going to write that he went directly because that's just quicker. So it's not, it's like missing the nitty gritty detail to just get the point across that he still went to Jesus, whether if he was in person or not, just sending people. So at the end of the day, he still came to Jesus, maybe not in person, um, but like you, you don't really, in the Luke account, it doesn't say like he was in person, by the way, like then that would be like a big discrepancy, but um yeah. i think it just has to do with what they valued of what the specifics that they wanted to to include because at the end of the day it doesn't really matter sometimes you just leave some stuff out when you're just trying to condense it all yeah that's right like if if i if i said today you know i asked pastor jonathan um you know how how he's holding up after the the shepherd's daughter died and he's been caring for them. I asked him that. Um, and I didn't include the fact that I called him on my cell phone. Would I be contradicting somebody? If Lindsay were to tell you, Adam talked to pastor Jonathan today on his cell phone and he, you know, to me, it's some, it's similar to that. It's very similar. One person um, doesn't feel like it's necessary to include the intermediary and the other person decides that it is important to include the intermediary. And it's not explicit in the, in the stories themselves as to why they've made this decision. But actually, if you consider, like we said before, who Luke's audience is compared to who Matthew's audience is, it actually becomes quite powerful. Because um, Luke writing to a Gentile audience is highlighting the Gentile centurion's humility 
by including the detail of the intermediaries. He's very concerned that Jesus knows that he believes that he's not worthy to be in his presence, which I think is powerful to the religious Jews who may be encountering this story, because they, in fact, can learn from the centurion's humility when it comes to approaching Jesus. But then Matthew highlighting the centurion's urgency by coming straight to Jesus and also Christ's mercy and divinity and being able to heal the, the servant at, at, a, at, the, at a word, you know, or whenever he believed, I think he's also communicating something powerful to the Jews in that they may have been presuming upon Christ's goodness to them as Israelites and sons of Abraham and saying, you still need to have urgency like the centurion. Uh, so I think there's something distinctly theological about each account uh, in the fact that he doesn't include the intermediaries in one and he includes them in the other. So not only is it not a dis not only is it not contradictory, but it's also communicating distinct and helpful theological points. Uh, not so much about Jesus himself, but uh, about how people are to react to who Jesus is and what he does. Any uh, follow-up to that account? Okay. Um, some other things that uh, Poitras includes that I think are helpful to note is as an errantess, um, and I think it's important for me to define what inerrancy is. I think it's very misunderstood. So if you believe that the Bible is inerrant, uh, I think even more precise to say that the scriptures are inerrant, um, would be to say that all that the scriptures claim is true. All that the scripture affirms is true. That's what it means to be an inerrantist. So it doesn't have anything to do with um, spelling errors or uh, it doesn't have anything to do with um, a failure to, to copy something correctly or anything like that. And we're not saying that grammatical the, errors, <laughs> grammatical errors, anything like that. No. When the Bible states something to be true, it means that it simply is true. That's what, that's what that means. Um, okay, so as an errantist, we also ought to consider, before we conclude that the Gospels contradict themselves, is first the possibility that apparently contradicting accounts are actually accounts of two distinct events. Uh, that's possible. It isn't, it isn't impossible for that to be the case. So let's say, let's take the, uh, the cleansing of the temple for an example. It's very possible that Jesus did that twice. Uh, that John is, is depicting an account of Jesus cleansing the temple at the beginning of his ministry and the Synoptic Gospels are, uh, are depicting an account of Jesus cleansing the temple at the end of his ministry. Um, we just went through this, but the, the, the fact that there's a difference between variation and contrast or contradiction, uh, theological selectivity of the authors, literary artistry, um, possible harmony between the accounts, and the significance of differing audiences. These are all things that we should consider before we conclude that the Gospels contradict themselves. I think, I think we might need to take a break. I might need a break. Is that okay? Can we take a can we take can we take a break? I'm good with it. Uh, you mentioned that this is like a fire hose a few minutes ago. I'm like, I'm yeah, I'm just feel, getting like tired. I'm feeling kind of like that. <laughs> Does anybody anybody want to anybody have anything else they want to share before we take a little break? I think I just need a drink of water or something. Oh, David, did you have something? Oh no. 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 <laughs> Just stretching. Whoa, David, your mic is like super loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well let's take a let's take a uh maybe we'll come back at nine oh five. Cool. Yeah, come back at nine oh five. Thanks guys. Eight minutes. Done. <laughs>
historical hypothesis. Jesus' burial, the discovery of his You guys like goofing around and messaging Anna during this? Because I just see her like dying laughing. No. It's just not. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> You're good. I mean, I have messaged Anna once. <laughs> Only once. Whatever's going on, I have nothing to do with it. I'm I'm yeah. on the record here. I've just been sitting here. Up to no good. <laughs> what? Up to no good. All right. We're back. The, the low ones are inside. <laughs> Snacking. Re rebooting for the, the home stretch here. That's what I like to see. Zot sticking with us. How, how's the weather in Timmins? It's really humid. <laughs> <laughs> How are you holding up, Mel? Good. Just worried that I'm going to see a bear and I'm going to have to run away. <laughs> no. Polar bear? We have, no, like we have uh, <laughs> black bears that literally go to your front porch. So you have to be very careful. <laughs> Kim, this is not that far north, Adam. I, don't... <laughs> I, know, I know. It's pretty far north, though. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Seth likes to read a book about a bear who is very private and there's a mouse that comes to his door and wants to have tea with him. And uh, he tells him to, he tells him to leave over and over again. Uh, but the mouse is so insistent and he like creeps into his bread drawer and then he, he's in his fridge and he's, you know, <laughs> all of his ca cabinets and he keeps finding him over and over again. And then eventually he uh, convinces the bear to have tea with him, and then the bear begs him to stay because he has such a great time with him. Uh, Aw, that's so cute. It's a pretty good story. Pretty good story. That's adorable. That's yeah, right? Cute. Also, I see why Seth would like that. <laughs> a good story. Jeez, Seth, Seth is currently enjoying the Big Picture Story Bible by Dave Helm. Uh, that's that's our current our current project. We just finished it once. We're going back through again. Um, all right, where are we here? The third thing to consider when examining uh, apparent discrepancies or contradictions in the Gospels, and this is related to the literary conventions of the time. Um, but there's a guy named Michael Kona. I mentioned him before. And I do want to give a caveat when I talk about Lacona and a disclaimer uh, that Lacona does seem to reject the biblical doctrine of inerrancy, which the Met affirms. And I, I would just say that if you're going to benefit from Lacona's teaching, his material, you should do so with a grain of salt. Uh, and my re recommendation would be just to chew and spit. And to feel free to reach out to me with questions if you wonder whether or not to affirm something he says. But he does debate Ehrman, and I think he debates him capably. I think by far the person who debates Ehrman the best is William Lane Craig. I think all of the people that I've seen debate Ehrman, I think basically lose. 
except for Craig. I think Craig destroys him. Not even close. Uh, it's very, very worth watching him dismantle Airman. Uh, but everybody else really struggles against him because he's, he's, he's very, very powerful in his rhetoric, uh, rhetorical skills. Okay, so Lacona, Lacona talks about how um, got the Gospels are a very unique genre and that they belong to the genre of ancient Greco-Roman bioi. Um, and they, what they did, uh, like, just like Craig Blomberg said and um, Mike Kruger said, who are both inerrantists, um, what he says is that they will take literary liberties, literary liberties, so liberties such as chronology. We talked about that with the cleansing of the temple. Liberties like uh, time compression. So um, the healing of Jairus' daughter in Matthew and Luke versus Mark. Or the cursing of the fig tree in Matthew versus Mark. And, and I, I kind of like this. Lacona gives the example of the guy versus the girl version of the story. So like if you, if you hang out with like a married couple long enough, you'll see that like when the husband goes to tell a story, he'll start telling it and the wife might chime in and say like, no, 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 that's, that's not how, quite how it goes. Like there were, there, you know, um, the Johnsons were there too. It wasn't just the, it wasn't just the, the Williamses, you know, the Johnsons were there too. And like, oh, I'm not sure that they were there that time. And you go back and forth and it was kind of like the guy version versus the girl version. He says that like the guy version sometimes is like, just giving you the, the cliff notes and all the essential details and the girl version of the story could sometimes uh, be more likely to include all of the details of the story. Um, and obviously those are, those are broad, you know, brash and broad generalizations, but uh, he's just trying to make a point that like some of the gospel writers like Mark, whose gospel is almost half the length of Matthew's gospel, is much more like the the guy version of the story is the is the argument that he's trying to make where you just like immediately this happened and immediately this happened and immediately this happened and immediately this happened um, and then the the other gospel writers are giving you the girl version of the story is is kind of like what he what he says I think that's interesting um, but there there sometimes will compress time or they'll they'll pause in the in the unfolding of time in their gospel. Uh, because of the cohesive nature of what they're trying to do in their gospel. Uh, another thing that they'll do is, is take liberties based upon narrative flow. So uh, an example would be in John's gospel where Mary anoints the, the um, Mary anoints Jesus after the raising of Lazarus, because he, that's when he had just introduced Mary and Martha into the gospel account. When the synoptics place that account in a different place. Um, for the sake of narrative flow. Um, and in that instance, I think there's at least one gospel that doesn't, doesn't even name her. Yeah. In that story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then there's um, what he calls portrait versus picture. And I think this is kind of interesting. And the, one of the, he's just trying to refute something that Airman does. So, one thing that Araman does is he says, you know, when when John when John comes to to be when when John presents Jesus coming to be crucified, he presents a very very confident and theologically developed Jesus. You know, somebody who's like who says in John 12, "My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour." But for this purpose, I've come to this hour. And then the synoptics, when Jesus goes to the cross, they have Jesus saying, Father, everything's possible with you. Remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. So Lacona is saying that like John might be painting more of a portrait and the synoptics might be giving you more of a snapshot picture of what, of what Jesus was saying uh, in the garden. And, uh, John is giving you more of a theological portrait of what Jesus was aware of that he was accomplishing uh, in his ministry. Uh, and I think that's kind of interesting. 
he, everything he says needs to be taken with a grain of salt because he doesn't affirm inerrancy. But these are just some things to consider because he knows a lot more about ancient biographies than I do. Uh, and he does a great job. I think his, his area of, of um, expertise is in this uh, ancient biographer named Plutarch. So he's like a Plutarch scholar. Uh, and he's also a New Testament scholar. And he has read everything by Plutarch and everything that everybody's ever written about Plutarch, who was also a first century biographer of other um, significant figures in the, in the time of Jesus. And he, he compares and contrasts the Gospels with his biographies. And it's really interesting to hear him talk about those. But he simply just knows way more than I do about all of that. And so I just say, well, you don't seem to align with where we align on our view of scripture, but I think what you're saying is really, really interesting. And it is giving me more confidence that these are more reliable than other ancient sources that are like them. Uh, and that's, that's helpful. Um, but Airman, Airman isn't interested in, are they more reliable than other kinds of biographies during the time? He's, he always says, well, no, I'm trying to figure out if they're historically reliable, period. Uh, and that's why I think it's it's they're kind of talking past each other. Uh, and finally, we 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 therefore can think about these apparent discrepancies. We must think about these apparent dis discrepancies with the posture of faith-seeking understanding. Maybe some of you have heard that. Uh, it's a it's a phrase attributed both to Saint Anselm of the 11th century and Saint Augustine of the 4th century. But simply, what what they're saying is because by faith, we believe that the Bible is the word of God, even as it claims to be the word of God. We believe it, and we pursue understanding as we go about believing. So it's faith-seeking understand. I believe in order that I might know. So we don't believe once we know something fully. So a great example of this would be the doctrine of the Trinity something that we all believe, and it's something that we hold as essential to our faith. But who among us would say that they fully understand the doctrine of the Trinity? And in like manner, when there's an apparent tension in something in God's word, whether it be an event in the Gospels uh, that appears to be different or maybe is an apparent discrepancy. Uh, we, what we want to do is approach it the same way as we would approach something like the Trinity and say, I believe that the Bible is the word of God, and I'm going to pursue understanding. So it, it's responsible of us to say, you know what, like, I'm not sure about that one yet, but I believe that the Bible is the word of God, and I'm going to pursue knowledge uh, accordingly. So just like we all grow in understanding of the Trinity, um, it's, it's an incomprehensible truth, but it doesn't mean it's untruth if it's incomprehensible. Uh, we just need to, we just need to con continue to pursue understanding. And it's possible that we won't understand every single one of the, the apparent tensions in the gospels. Uh, we don't want to explain them away, uh, hastily and then do damage to the text itself. Okay, those are the first two. So we've talked about the Jesus of the Gospels is not a historical character, for they're simply not they're simply fictional characters. I think I think we're fairly confident that, that we can we can tackle that one. Um, and then the second one is that the gospel accounts contradict one another. Any last thoughts, questions, infuriated rants that you would like to include in this? round table before we move to point number three all that and we're only through two of them wow <laughs> well i i gave us till i gave us till uh 10 o'clock i believe so and i think the the last the last ones are much shorter so is that is that your infuriated rant candy I don't know if it was infuriated. I'm just like, wow, there's, there's, there's a lot there. <laughs> well, you are the sweetest man at the Met. So even if you are infuriated, it's going to be communicated <laughs> sweetly. <laughs> All right. 
Um, any any other any other uh, comments? Katie Caps, are you conscious or what's going on there? She's she's con she's out. She's nowhere. Olivia, how are you doing? They're gone. All right. Maybe they're dead. I I don't think they're dead, but I don't think they're anywhere near the computer. Um, all right. Here we go. <laughs> Natalie's really Natalie really got a kick out of that one. Oh man. Okay. All right. This is this is probably my favorite one. Um, the Gospel of John depicts a different Jesus than the Synoptic Gospels. Now, uh, this is one that Ehrman goes for all the time, and I think it's his weakest argument as an objection to the reliability of the Gospels, and I'll show you why. So here's a really, really cool just textual example as to how they're consistent. So if you read the Gospel of John, um, it's probably the most extensive in the way that it um, talk, gives, you, gives you windows into the inner, inner thought life of Jesus and the relationship between God the Father and God the Son as Jesus is thinking about it and preaching about it in his life and ministry. So Jesus talks, says, you know, I and the Father are one. Um, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's all of this triune uh, theology that happens in John's gospel. And so Ehrman says, you know, Jesus never claims to be God in the synoptics, but he does it all the time in, in the gospel of John. But then if you, if you look at things like Matthew 11 and Luke 10, uh, it almost looks like these are citations from something from John. So Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus, Jesus says, All things have been handed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. But that sounds so Joanine. It sounds like something John would, would depict Jesus saying. Um, and then Luke 10, 22, all things have been handed over to me by a father. No one knows the son except the father or, or who the father except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. So, uh, that, that just, it's, so read John's gospel and the things Jesus says, and then read those things. And it's almost verbatim what Jesus would say in John. Um, and there's this, so I think the thing that that makes Ehrman so powerful is because it's so quickly apparent that he knows the gospels better than you do. And so when he's rattling off all of these things and the way he starts every debate is to say, you know what? I used to be a fundamentalist Christian and I used to believe all the things that, you know, Mike Lacona believes or William Lane Craig believes or, James White believes or whoever he's debating at the time. And he's like, I used to try to convince people to believe them. And then I started studying the Bible in the original languages. And I started to read ancient sources about the gospels. And I studied Latin and German and Greek and all these things. And then I realized the Bible isn't true. Uh, that's what he prefaces everything by doing, by saying, look at how smart I am and look at all the reading I've done. Now, everything I say, you have to take at face value. And everything I'm saying is trustworthy and nothing that this fundamentalist Christian who still believes the Bible is saying is true. And you just have to watch out for what I've called the airman tactic. And I think my favorite example of this is when he's debating Peter Williams. And he, he paints this picture from John's gospel. And he says... Jesus claims to be God all the time in John's gospel. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And I am, in the Greek, is ego eimi, which is the exact verbatim translation of what the Lord says before Moses in Exodus chapter 3 in the burning bush. 
So Jesus is claiming to be God. Before Abraham was, I am. I and the Father are one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He, he rattles off all of these I am statements by Jesus, and he's saying what John is doing there is, is, is depicting Jesus as claiming to be God. And he's like, why don't any of the synoptic gospels portray Jesus as, as saying that he's God? And he builds his argument based upon how John depicts a Jesus who knows that he's divine, and the synoptic gospels depict a Jesus who is, isn't divine. Or the synoptic gospels don't authors don't believe that he's divine, and therefore the Jesus tradition evolved by the time John wrote his gospel, and we have a divine Jesus by the time that John's writing. That's that's basically what he does, and that's very very powerful if you haven't read your gospels very closely, because and I've I've said this to Natalie, I've I've said this in my class, and I I taught on this before, but Williams without even thinking is like, Bart, that's not true. And I was like so refreshed because I know he goes in his lectures and he's got a bunch of first year university students that sit in there and they haven't read their Bibles very carefully. And they're like, oh my gosh, there's two Jesuses according to the Bible. But Peter Williams is like, that's not true, Bart. Haven't you read Mark 6? Because in Mark 6, the disciples are out and they're rowing in their boat and they're having trouble against the storm after Jesus just fed the 5,000, by the way. And he walks out onto the water. By the way, have you seen anybody else walking on the water? Um, why do you think Jesus can walk on the water? Well, it's because he's the one who made the water by speaking it into existence. And what does he say to the disciples when he walks up to the boat? when they're terrified at seeing him and they think he's a ghost. Does anybody know what he says to them? He says, I am. That's what he says. Mark depicts him saying two words. Ego a me is the very same thing that he depicts Jesus saying in John, in all of the I am statements. And so the earliest gospel is depicting Jesus walking on water and claiming to be God. And Ehrman is simply using a deceptive technique to trick people who haven't read their Bibles closely enough that Jesus isn't God. And it's, it's just plain and simple deceit. Um, and it's just simply not true that other New Testament authors uh, don't claim that Jesus is God. It's also noteworthy to, to uh, say that Paul was writing before all of the gospel writers. Paul's letters were, are dated earlier than Mark. And there are numerous times where Paul depicts Jesus as explicitly divine. I just picked a few. Colossians 2.9, in Christ the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Colossians 1.15-19, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Yeah. You guys have, yes? Oh, well, I was just going to add, Adam, to that, like the thing you said about walking on water. It also says that Jesus wanted to pass them by, which oh, is man. like, yeah, which is like God, what God says to Moses when Moses wants to see the face of God. So I just thought that adding that to that kind of example you were giving just adds to the divinity of Jesus that he's trying to, like that Mark writes about. Like, I mean, like normally, like, you know, you wouldn't write that part, right? Like Jesus was trying to pass us by when we were yeah. struggling. So, but I think that's put specifically there to kind of elevate the divinity of Jesus yeah, in comparing right. to the, like, you know, what you were saying earlier. This is the same dude that Jesus was talking to on Sinai. Or sorry, that Moses was talking to on Sinai. That's exactly right. Like, he meant to pass him by. That is a horrifyingly embarrassing detail if it's not meant to depict Jesus as divine. Because the very reason it seems like he's going out on the water is to help these poor souls to not drown. And it says he meant to pass them by. 
Um, you're right. That's that's a helpful thing. I, I'm always just so struck that it says ego a me because you know that Airman is aware that it says that. Uh, and he's he's just hoping that Williams hasn't done his homework. And then Williams is like, um, sorry, pal. Like, it says that in, in Mark 654 or whatever. Essentially rips Airman to shreds. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's just not true. Um, and and not only does Mark believe that Jesus is divine, but Paul believes that Jesus is divine. Uh, and John, uh, the first letter, the first letter of John uh, in chapter five says that Jesus is God as well. So Paul in Colossians one says Christ is the fullness, as the image of the invisible God. By Him all things were created, and in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And then in chapter nine, he says, Christ is God over all, blessed forever. Uh, so an earlier source than Mark was explicitly claiming that Jesus is God. And that therefore breaks down Ehrman's argument that the Jesus tradition started to claim that Jesus is God around AD 90 um, in order to gain converts. So that argument simply doesn't follow. Number four. Any other uh, any other reflections on on that one? John depicts a different Jesus than the Synoptic Gospels. I find it interesting that you said it's the same, like in the Walking on Water account, Jesus used the same two words, the "I am." That gets lost in the English translations because. I, if I'm remembering correctly, the English translations usually depict him as saying something like, it is I, don't be afraid. Yeah, that's right. Like, well, if he's actually saying, <laughs> I am, like the same thing that he like, legitimately, the English translations have left out a lot of the power of what he said, what he actually said. Yeah, and I think that's, that's why earlier I said, you know, we believe the Bible's inerrant, because I think I think most of us, when we say the Bible, we're talking about our like English translations that we carry around. And I'm not saying that those aren't the word of God. They are the word of God. Um, but they're not the, they're not the communicative event that we believe is inerrant and inspired. We believe that what Paul received from the Lord and delivered unto us, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that is what was inspired and inerrant. And then that was copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and copied. And, copied. Um, and even more assuringly so, if we found the first copy of any of the books of the Bible, which we don't have, we wouldn't think that there's anything special about it because we don't believe that it's the piece of paper that is the inspired thing. We believe it's the communication from God as it's as it was written uh, by the human authors, um, and so we need to we need to remember that that's what we believe Scripture is, and so we need to be precise when we're talking about it. Um, so, like, yeah, I, if I was if I was translating Mark six, I would have depicted Jesus saying, "I am," personally. Uh, it's the most literal thing that it. it it would possibly be from the Greek there. Uh, okay, number four. Books that record supernatural events or miracles, such as the resurrection of Jesus, are not trustworthy. Ehrman goes so far as to say that if you believe in the resurrection, it is for theological reasons, period. He says, he goes so far as to say that the, the, the resurrection is not a historical claim. Um, his basic logic for this, uh, and I've watched n a number of debates uh, that he's done with William Lane Craig, and there's one that I've, I've uh, cited on this document here uh, that I think would be worth watching in his, its entirety, is he basically says that because a miracle at any given moment in time is the least likely event, is the least probable event. So he says, you know, if if there was somebody that could walk on water, but there isn't anybody who can walk on water, but let's say there was one person that could walk on water. That's one out of 
9 billion or whatever it is, um, people that exist. And um, he's like, that is therefore the least likely or least probable occurrence um, or explanation of an event uh, today. And so to say that the resurrection is the most probable explanation for the events surrounding the life and ministry of Jesus is doesn't follow logically and therefore it cannot be historically defended. That's his logic. I don't think it follows. Lane Craig destroys it with uh, this big equation and uh, it's really interesting to see. But um, even if what Ehrman is saying is right, that the only reason we can affirm the resurrection is for theological reasons, J. Gresham Machen has a wonderful answer to that. And I think it's, it's really interesting and powerful to read. He says, if Jesus were merely a man like the rest of men, then an ideal is all that we have in him. Far more is needed by a sinful world. It's a small comfort to be told there was goodness in the world when what we need is goodness triumphant over sin. But goodness triumphant over sin involves an entrance of the creative power of God. And that creative power of God is manifested by the miracles. Without the miracles, the New Testament might be easier to believe. But the thing that would be believed would be entirely different from that which presents itself to us now. Without the miracles, we should have a teacher. With the miracles, we have a savior. So he says, yeah, sure, like the, the gospels would be easier to believe if there were no mu miracles in them, but they would be insufficient for the needs that we have in light of sin. And Jesus would be a teacher only without the miracles, and, but with them, he's a savior. And I think that's a wonderful, a wonderful quote. But William Lane Craig refutes Ehrman. Uh, on the grounds that there's plenty of historical evidence for the following historic, four historical facts. And thus, the best explanation for these four irrefutable facts is that Jesus rose again. So what, Aaron, what, what Clay, Craig does is he says, you know what, Bart, like, you're not actually claiming that the resurrection is the least probable event. What you're arguing is that the resurrection is the least probable explanation for the historical events surrounding it. And he breaks it down that way. And he's arguing that the resurrection, in fact, is the most probable explanation for the four historical events that every historian, for the most part, agrees. Ehrman, in his own literature, says that he agrees with these um, facts. And Craig says, number one, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, his tomb was discovered empty. Um, he has post-mortem appearances. Um, Ehrman explains that away through uh, the Christians having visions, uh, but he believes that that happened. Uh, and the origin of the disciples, uh, it's traceable. So people believing that Jesus rose again, it's traceable to the first century. Um, and so the best explanation for those four facts is that Jesus rose again, according to Lane Craig. And that's a historical argument, not a theological one. Does that make sense? Okay. So the resurrection is a historically reliable claim based upon at it being an explanation for these historically reliable facts. And finally, the original documents could not have been recorded and copied faithfully to be made available to us today. Peter Williams says, the situation for the New Testament text is that there are no words that are known or even widely believed by textual critics to be missing from the New Testament text. So, Globally, New Testament critics agree that there are no words missing. That's what he's saying. That is a remarkable thing. Um, but this thing will be used very, very widely at a popular level 
people will say, you know, these books are so old and there's so much copying and there's so much reason to believe that we can't possibly have what was originally written. And that's the conclusion Ehrman makes as well. We don't have the New Testament, is what he'll say. Um, but then when you look at the data, it's very clear that we do have the New Testament. The scholars point out that there may be as many as 400,000 textual variants in the thousands of known Greek New Testament manuscripts. Okay, so just, just looking at that alone, it, it does look problematic, right? So there's 400,000 textual variants amongst the New Testament texts. But then if you break this down a little bit further, how many manuscripts do we have? Well, according to the Airman Project, there are 5,700 plus manuscripts of the New Testament, almost 6,000 manuscripts. And amongst other writings of the comparable era, a typical amount of manuscripts would be 10 or 20. 10 or 20 manuscripts. We have 5,700 of the New Testament. Um, Piper has a helpful video that you can watch uh, after this if you want. Um, and this is the key. So if you look a little bit deeper, so just looking at those numbers, it looks a little bit problematic. But if you look at all of the texts, if you were to lay them out completely and you were to examine all 400,000 of those textual variants, on average, that means that there are only 16 unique variants per manuscript. We're talking about manuscripts that come from the first and second century. 16 variants per manuscript. And the vast majority of these involve variations in the spelling of words, the use or non-use of an article, conjunction or particle, or slight variation in syntax, like word order. This means, therefore, that not one single variant has a significant bearing on a single historical or theological detail. Blomberg concludes that no doctrine or ethical teaching of Christianity depends solely on one or more disputed texts. And that's amazing. So 400,000 textual variants and not a single one of them has any bearing on any of the historical or theological claims of the New Testament. The only one that you could possibly argue is from 1 John chapter 5, which is a Trinity verse that appears in the King James and it doesn't appear in any of the other translations. And it's likely because Erasmus was convinced to include it because people during, during the 12th century were pressuring him into including a verse about the Trinity when there was a rise in Trinitarian heresies going on. And it's the only tradition that includes the verses that appear in 1 John chapter 5. None of the other traditions do. Um, but the Trinity is very clearly stated, you know, basically in, in other texts. So even this, even this significant variant has no bearing on any theological conclusions that we can make about the New Testament. So I think praise the Lord, praise the Lord for that. Um, we will not find any variants that have any bearings on any historical or theological claims of Christianity at all, no matter how hard you look. And that, that's included 5,700 manuscripts. Therefore, my friends, the four New Testament Gospels are reliable. <laughs> <Whoopee. laughs> All right. Um, I sort of expected that's where we were going to land at the end of this anyway, but, you know, still, it's good. <laughs> good we're, just scr we're just scratching the surface. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a scholar. I have done some reading. I've paid attention to some stuff that Airman says and other people, how they respond. Um, but if you do want to do some reading, if you want to do some further study, 
I've included 16 sources for you to, to explore. So um, there should be no shortage of information <laughs> that, might, uh, that might extend from this round table discussion. Uh, and I have, I have a good amount of these resources, so if you want to, to borrow any of them, you can uh, let me know. I would say the place to start would be this um, Airman Project website. I just, it's like a vault of awesome videos that talk about all the issues that Airman brings up. Um, but he, he is the most influential scholar that's an antagonist to the reliability of the, the Gospels, and I wanted you guys to be aware of him. Uh, and also to realize that he's, he contradicts himself and everything that he proposes has been answered or is being answered by evangelical scholarship very capably. Uh, so don't be too rattled if you do uh, interact with more of his stuff. If you want to see him get destroyed, then watch his debate against William Lane Craig and... Uh, you'll realize that he's not as smart as he appears because Lane Craig is twice as smart as him. All right. I think you mean he's not as smart as he thinks he is. <laughs> yeah, he's not. He's not. He is very smart, though. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to him. He's very, very smart. But he's, uh, he's only a man. He's only a man. All right. Any, any last-minute thoughts? Any uh, any fun weekend plans? Vacations coming up. I mean, other than not having to having to go through a whole pre-record session tomorrow, win. <laughs> but yeah, Joe, Joe, thank you for all of your tireless editing. Oh, I mean, it's been tiring, but it's been a joy. It's been uh, it's been good. Yeah, we, we wouldn't have we wouldn't be able to have church without you, brother. <laughs> well done. I'm excited for Wyatt Beach. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, Natalie, we got we're gonna have to socially distance, my friend. No hugs, Nat. <laughs> she said she was gonna hug people behind my back. <laughs> no hugs, Nat. <laughs> None of that. I'll be do watching. You, do you have an idea of how that's gonna work? Like Pastor Adam, do you do you know like what's gonna happen? Is it just gonna be like socially distanced? Yeah, yeah, outside and try to try to stay, you know, arm's length away from people and play some volleyball and okay. enjoy some time together. I might, I might join you one day. I'm coming yeah. to Ottawa, so maybe I'll Join. We're uh, we're starting on the thirtieth, I think. Yeah, I'm driving home on the thirtieth, so I won't be able to. But the next week, I'll be able to. Nice. It'll be great to see you. Any any other things? Thank you so much for for indulging me here. Uh, this has been a labor of love over the past couple of weeks, but it's been it's been enjoyable uh, and. Uh, Please, please do uh, download this, this handout and explore some of the resources. Uh, there's a tremendous amount. Of, there's, a, there's a wellspring of, of reasons and, and uh, scholarship on this. And it's, it's really, really wonderful to, to, to be able to believe by faith that the, the Gospels are God's word, but then to see that there's all kinds of reasons to believe it outside of the internal evidence. So thank you all so much. And uh, we will see you, see some of you on Sunday perhaps, and we'll see you guys virtually Thursday. And uh, if you guys need prayer or anything, we're, we are going to have a prayer session on Sunday afternoon, uh, at one o'clock. So feel free to join, join me for that. Thank you guys so much. You guys have a wonderful night. Thanks. Thanks so much, you Adam. too. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.